All right. Thank you so much for coming out tonight uh, to hear our alumni speaker, Kelly DeFelice, graduated in December of 2018. Currently, she is a graduate student at UMass Amherst, and she will be telling us about her experiences with school psychology. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so thanks for having me. My name is Kaylee. I'm in my third year of UMass Amherst School Psychology PhD program. So I got about two more years to go. It's around a five to six year program, depending on when I get my dissertation done. Um, so with that said, I just want to give kind of a quick overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll just preview kind of um, what my time here at Eastern was like and how I felt like I was like set up to apply to graduate school right after undergrad. And I just want to acknowledge that this is just my experience and some students may decide to take a year or two off before applying to grad school and get some work experience in and that is totally valid too. So for me, I graduated in, in December 2018, applied to graduate school that semester and then started graduate school the following year in fall in the fall of 2019. Um, I'll give a quick school psych overview um, and then the related requirements of applying for graduate school for school psych. Um, I will talk about my current research as a third year grad student in my practicum and then I'll try to sum it all up with some lessons learned along the way and I really want to ask you to please jot down any questions you have during it because I'm sure there's something that I haven't covered and so I'd love to hear your questions at the end. And so just to get a quick overview before we start, has anyone ever heard of school psychology before? You could raise your hand. Okay. Have you heard of it and kind of have like a pretty good understanding of what it is? Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So I hope this uh, presentation kind of lets you know what school psychology is, if you're interested, ways that you can set yourself up for success, and then like what it looks like as a school psych grad student. So back to the beginning. I came into Eastern as an elementary education major. I told myself since I was little that I wanted to be an elementary school teacher. Um, and then it was about like a year into Eastern where I started taking some psych classes that I dropped the education major and switched solely to psychology. I really just felt like the questions I was having was more about like the behind the scenes work of how a school works rather than the sole role of the elementary school teacher. Um, and so I was kind of finding myself asking questions like, how are students actually learning? What are teachers instructing their, their students with? Why do some students like love school and other students it's like the worst day ever for them? So I kind of wanted to like address these questions and I found that psychology majoring in that kind of was a better fit for me. Um, and so I had kind of just these broad interests of child development, learning, and behavior analysis. And so with these experiences and with these interests in mind, I went to talk to my advisor, Dr. Luschinski, and I think this was still like my freshman year, and I couldn't quite do like internship yet. And so she suggested I just shadow a school psychologist because I'd heard about it. I thought it might be something I wanted to do. And so what I did was at the end of my freshman year, I just emailed a local school psychologist from my hometown and asked if I could come and observe her for a couple days just so I could like see what it was like and see if it was something I wanted to look into more. So that's just a tip I would say that if you have like any small interest in any career, I think any observation experience would be really helpful. Um, so that gave me like a slight understanding of what school psychology was. She also gave me the opportunity to observe a speech pathologist to, just to see what that was like too. And after that experience, I was like, okay, I'm into school psychology, not so much speech pathology, so let me like run with that. So I went on to intern through Eastern with a school psychologist at a K through two school. This really showed me like the day to day life of a school psych. Um, and I just got to observe her like give IQ tests and conduct evaluations. And I also got to lead my own little like lunch bunch group where I taught, we practiced going over like pro-social skills with some students. Um, and so while this was helpful, it still left me a little bit uncertain if school psychology was right for me. I had 
I knew that I still had like interest in conducting research. I just didn't know what that could look like. So um, I think it was at the end of my sophomore year, I just decided to look into all possible child development research labs that were hiring undergrads for the summer. And I was thankfully accepted at a research lab at Yale's Mind and Development Lab. And I just want to clarify that this position was not paid. It was a summer of pretty much doing volunteer work, but I was getting a line on my resume and also just like, okay, is this something that is right for me? I was hoping to answer that after that experience. And so myself and other undergrads were working on a project, it was like a pilot study on children's morality and like theories of child morals. Um, and we got experience with like recruiting participants and running the experiment and also like reviewing literature around it. And I learned after a long summer working there that I did not like it. Like I did not want to be involved with theoretical things about child morality, but I take that still as like a lesson for me that's like, okay, I'm into working with kids. I like research, but I don't like this type of research. Um, so my last slide about like my time at Eastern. So I still had in the back of my mind, like I always wanted to be an elementary school teacher. So I wanted to still like work in the schools a little bit more um, and get some other experience that wasn't quite with teaching. So I interned with a school social worker here in uh, Willimantic, had a K through five school. And this was a really great experience for me because I felt like the school social worker was really honest with me about what education education is like um, because I was reading in my classes at Eastern, you know, best practices about how students learn and like how important relationships are and how important mental health is for students and all these ways we should be building up students so that they learn. And then I was in an internship where I just was not seeing this happen. And I was talking with the school social worker and she was like, yeah, like, this is what this is what school is like. And so I really learned that there was this like research to practice gap. Like we know it's supposed to be done, but then what does it really look like happening in school? So that really made me motivated to stay more on this research side of like um, school psychology and how can we like best support students in schools. Um, I also took on some research assistantships. I did one with Dr. Sisko and one with Dr. Lischinski. And so these were not quite related to like my school-based research interests, but they still really helped me understand like how a study is done, how we develop a research question, the methods, um, how to write up results. So those I thought were really valuable because that also pushed me in the direction of like, okay, maybe I should pursue a, a PhD route. And lastly, I also did some independent studies. I think in my last year or two at Eastern, I did one with Dr. Danforth, who's not here anymore, but I really used that as just an opportunity to like read about my own research interests. And so at that time I was interested in what the research says about work, uh, placing students with disabilities in a general ed classroom in an inclusive classroom versus the outcomes of keeping them separated. So it was kind of just like a mini lit review. I wanted to see like what was out there and I was able to just put a poster together for like a local, I think it was like a central um, state university conference. Um, so that really just gave me some more research experience as well. And then the other independent study, um, after taking Learning 2 with Dr. Diller, which is an awesome class, um, we worked on a paper in that class where we had to integrate behavior analysis with like an area of interest. And so after that class, Dr. Diller and I co-authored a paper called Behavior Analysis and Intersectional Feminism, which we got published and really just helped me be like, okay, like I like this research route. I like writing about um, things that I'm interested in. And so all these experiences made me feel like pursuing a PhD in school psych was right for me. So now, what is school psychology? So I have actually taken these slides from NASP 
which is the National Association of School Psychology. So these slides are pre-made. So school psychologists, they are professionals with a graduate degree working in school settings. They provide comprehensive psychological and educational services to diverse students to promote children's learning, development, and support students' social emotional health. So that seems kind of very broad, and I just wanted to put this in perspective as when I tell people I'm in, I am, I'm, I'm in a school psych grad program, they'll think, oh, you're training to be a school counselor, <laughs> which I'm like, well, it's a little different, and I'll talk about that next. Um, and the second thing they think is, oh, school psychologists are the ones that test students, which is partially tr true. Um, assessment is one of our roles. And so what that looks like in the school setting is a teacher may notice a student in their class that's really fallen behind either academically or um, social, emotionally, and behaviorally, and might suspect that they have a disability that's like impacting their learning. And so a referral is placed and that means that the school psychologist is responsible for doing a whole assessment of the student to see if they might meet eligibility for a disability that could be the reason that their learning is impacted. And so while that is really important, myself and many other school psychs take the perspective that um, we should be supporting students before they reach this point of they're falling so behind and they now need to be evaluated, maybe they have a disability, no, let's maybe support students before they get to that point. And so that is like a major role of what school psychology is called prevention and intervention, which I'll talk about next. Okay, so that first role, like I just said, is assessment. So we are trained to give um, intellectual functioning tests, IQ tests, and achievement tests. So that's one part of the assessment but we'll also want to observe that student in multiple settings and see how they um, react and how their behavior is dependent on different settings, what's happening before their behavior, what's making it seem harder or easier for them to learn. We'll also give um, the teachers or the people that know the students best, so that's like they're their teacher and then their caregiver, a rating scale to fill out how, the, how those people perceive their, the student's behavior to be. We'll give the student a rating scale if they're at that ability to read and really understand, so that's usually not until third or fourth grade. And then we'll also review their past records, their academic history, their medical history, and that is the whole thing that makes up assessment. And that, after that assessment is done, we say, yeah, it does look like they might have a disability that's impacting their learning. Or, no, if we change a couple things in their classroom, it seems like they'll learn a lot better. Um, so that's assessment. And the next role of a school psychologist is consultation. I just took my consultation class last semester. And so it's really all about um, empowering and supporting the staff in schools to be able to solve problems that come up on a day-to-day -day basis. So that, look, that can be like formal, like, okay, I'm gonna meet with this teacher once a week, or it can be like a quick chat in the hallway. So what that typically looks like is a teacher comes to the school psych and says, I have, I've been having a really hard time controlling the student's behavior in my classroom. They're really acting out. And so the school psych will say, okay, I'm gonna come and do a couple observations, really see what's going on in this class, take some data, and then later meet with the teacher, go over what the school psych is seeing, and try to empower the teacher to try some new strategies that might um, better help her uh, use her classroom management skills. And so that's a really big ongoing process, but it's a really big role that the school site takes on. The next two parts kind of go hand in hand, prevention and inter intervention. And so this um, prevention is how we support students before they're so far behind that now we're saying they need to be evaluated. So we do this through school-wide screening. Has anyone heard of school-wide screening for academics? or mental health, okay, a little bit. So for academics, that looks like, and schools will have different um, levels of doing this fully at each school, it can look different, but in a best case scenario, we'll want the school three times a year to do benchmarking, which is we give all the students really quick tests in reading and math, take that data, see the students who are 
at the lowest who might not already have been identified as needing support, and we try to give those students support. Um, so that's a way to try to catch some students at least three times a year if they're not already being supported. And then mental health screening is actually relatively new. I didn't even know mental health screening was a thing in schools until I started the program. And so that's where we'll have teachers um, fill out rating scales, social, emotional, behavioral rating scales of all the students in their class and the students who at kind of the bottom quartile, if they're not already being seen by a counselor or being seen for some extra support, the school psych will make sure that those students get the support that they need. So those are the four really major roles I would say a school psych does. Um, I'm not going to touch upon the next four just because it can look so different at each school, but if you're interested in the next four, please just let me know after this and we can talk more. And I just want to emphasize that um, some school psychologists do more, do really just assessment. That is not what I want to do. I, I want to be equipped to do assessment, but I really want to advocate for students and pursue these other roles as well. So just kind of zooming out to big picture, um, school psychologists link mental health to learning and behavior because they're all intertwined. So it has been shown that, if, that there's higher academic achievement, positive social skills and behavior, healthy relationships, when we're considering all these variables in the student's context. Um, and so this really just simplified means if a student is having trouble, if a student has some behavioral problems as deemed by the teacher or mental health struggles, they're likely going to be having a really hard time sitting still in that classroom and getting an A on their assignment or completing that assignment. So when do children need a school psych? I would say that every student deserves a school psychologist, but they most likely are called in when there are difficulties that arise, so learning, behavior, attention difficulties, problems at home or with peers, big life-changing events or when a crisis or trauma happens. But in general, I view a school psychologist as just an advocate of a student's learning and their mental health and behavioral needs. So most school psychologists work in the public school setting followed by colleges and universities. Personally, for me, I knew I wanted to practice as a school psychologist in the school setting. And to do that, I would need to get my education specialist degree, which I'll go into next. But I was also, through my experience at Eastern, really wanted to keep that research door open. I wanted to answer these bigger questions. And I also wanted to have more flexibility if I didn't want to just work in a school I could work in academia or more so focus on research or do have a somewhat easier route to private practice. Um, but it is most common that school psychs will work in public schools. So how do school psychs differ from a school counselor? Um, I think I like to sum this up by saying that it, it, if you're at a school where there's not a school counselor, that school psychologist can take some roles that school counselor has, like doing mental health counseling, but then also be able to do assessments, like IQ testing, and those other roles I described, like consultation. Um, at schools where there is a school counselor and a school psych, a school psych may do less of that mental health counseling and more of just those other four roles I described. Um, and then in general, like school psychs, don't really get involved with uh, course scheduling, career planning, um, and yes, we come more from this like educational psychology background rather than a counseling background. Okay, so how do I become a school psychologist? So for undergrad, I also just say that you'll need to look at the specific program that you're applying to but I think all programs require a bachelor's degree. So you'll need a bachelor's degree, but, um, and it would be helpful if that degree was in something related to school psych, so psychology, sociology, education. Um, but I would just say be sure to check that program's requirements. 
It would be really helpful if you have volunteer or work experience with children and youth. So really just with grad school in general, you'll want to have some experience because you will write personal statements of why you feel like you can uh, pursue this career and be in this grad program and you'll want to give examples. So I was able to give examples of the internships I went on and why I liked working with kids and also some research experience I had. So really for PhD programs it would be helpful if you could try to get any research experience you can, re uh, whether that be work with um, a professor in the program or maybe pursuing like an independent study and going into your own research interests. Oh, I also wanted to, s oh, did I? Yes, I also wanted to say that the research method sequence was really helpful for me here because I, I like really was, I was interested in uh, delivering praise to students and whether that affects their on task performance. And so I was also able to use that research methods course as an example of like doing research that I used in my personal statement as well. Okay, so to be certified as a school psychologist, you will need a specialist level degree. This is called different things at different programs, which makes it a bit confusing. For my program at UMass Amherst, we have an education specialist degree, it's called, and it's a three year program. So I would say look for programs that are around three years. Um, and so if you would like your specialist degree to become a school psychologist, you will take, you will have three years and two years of classwork and practicum experience. So practicum experience meaning like being in the schools, seeing what it's like day to day, and also taking classes. And that third year with the specialist program, you'll go on a full-time internship. So my cohort came in, it was a group of us, six girls, three of us were EDS students and three of us, including myself, were PhD. So we all took the same classes and had the same practicum experience the first two years, but now the EDS girls are on internship and us PhD students are still chugging along. <laughs> so, um, and that allows for work in schools as a school psychologist. So with the doctoral level school psychology degree, um, the main difference here is that you will be doing more research related to the field. So in your third year, instead of going on internship, you will start your advanced practicum um, and get started with, with dissertation. So you will need to complete a dissertation, which I'm getting started thinking about now. Um, and you will do kind of more outside district level work with schools. So doing outside evaluations, doing consultation for like really big problems that districts have. Um, and yeah, and then there's those more opportunities for independent practice, research, you'll have a bit more flexibility if you do the PhD route, which is um, what I wanted. Okay, so the job outlook for school psychologists is really good. <laughs> there is a shortage of school psychologists. We don't have enough to meet the demand, um, and there's an especial need for professionals from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. School psychologist has listed, has been listed as one of the top 10 best social service jobs. And if you are looking for a job with a lot of like different responsibilities, opportunities to use different skill sets related from psychology, I would say this is the job for you. You're working with students, but you're also making bigger level changes at the school too. So now I'm going to transition into what my life has looked like as a graduate student. So to begin, um, so it is expected in my program that if you're a doc student, you join at least one research lab and participate in at least one research project. So I'm a part of supporting positive learning across school and home with my advisor, Dr. Sarah Pfeffer, and I'm also a part of the lab supporting mental health and learning environments. And so you can see we love our acronyms. I did partially come up with one of them. And for SPLASH, this is the project where I'm funded through. So I was also lucky to be fully funded for all my years here, which is definitely something you wanna look into when applying is 
does the program have funding? How does that work? You might have to dig in like the program handbook a little bit or email the uh, faculty as well. And so I really chose UMass because I felt like my research interests best align with the program faculties. So just to briefly go over my personal interests, I'm interested in supporting teachers and implementing evidence-based classroom management strategies. So something I have been fascinated with is that teachers report handling student behavior in their classrooms as one of the top things that they need support in. It's one of the top things they ask for in professional development, and it's one of the top reasons they leave the field is because they don't feel equipped to handle student behavior that leads them to feeling stressed. Um, and it's interesting that our teacher training programs do not spend, there are studies that show that most teacher training programs do not spend at least one course talking about student behavior and the importance of seeing a student in that behavior analytic lens of what is the function of their behavior and what are some appropriate consequences. So I'm really interested in, well, if teachers are feeling this way, how can we as school psychologists really help them feel more effective in handling cl classroom management? I'm also interested in school psychologists' role in advocating for equitable education practices. So studies consistently show that stu African American students, Hispanic students, and students with disabilities are disciplined at a far higher rate than white students and students without disabilities for doing the same behavior. So it is a fact that we all have implicit biases. It's showing in our school and it leads to a school to prison pipeline. How can we in the school system put a halt to that at a minimum? So how can we as school psychologists work with teachers to address these biases and give them different strategies or just awareness or something so that these inequities are not consistently showing. And then broadly, I'm interested in school-based interventions to promote students' mental health. So you can see these personal research interests of mine kind of fall in between one of these two labs that I'm involved with. So now I'm going to talk about the project that I am funded on. So this is the Wellbeing Promotion Program, and my advisor is a co-PI on it. Um, we're doing studies, we're working with schools in Massachusetts and in Florida for five years and tracking outcomes over time. So what it is is five-year efficacy study of a novel school-based positive psychology intervention that is already manualized. I actually have the book with me here if you're interested, and it is we are trying to deliver it to school mental health staff, so school psychologists, school counselors, to work with their students to see if it increases their subjective well-being, which is a scientific word for happiness. So studies show that we should not just be, or not studies show, but it is important that we address students' complete mental health and not just students who um, don't have psychopathology or disabilities, but also are our students happy in the school setting? And even if they don't necessarily have a disorder, are they satisfied with life? So that's kind of the background of where this project comes from. So what it is is 10 weeks where I'm a co-leader, so myself and a school staff member deliver in a small group. We teach students positive psych-related activities so these have research behind them that's shown that if you use these activities consistently over time, your happiness will increase. So things like doing gratitude, we take a survey that teaches them what their strengths are, um, using optimistic thinking. So our hypothesis is that students who participate in the well-being promotion program, we have a waitlist control group, will experience lasting gains in happiness, fewer symptoms of psychopathology, increase school engagement, and improve academic performance over time. So that was a lot in a couple slides, so please feel free to discuss anything that I didn't cover or any questions after. So what my role looks like is I am a co-leader, so I lead two groups with the school mental health staff, uh, so that's three days a week right now. I'm the site contact at the middle school, so everything research procedures and logistics wise. We reward teachers and caregivers for completing surveys with gift cards. So I deliver those gift cards. I make sure that the materials are at the school. 
data management, so entering data each week, and of course developing and supporting research proposals around the project. The second project I'm involved in comes from the SMILE Lab, and so this is a really new, the IRB just got approved project called Feedback for the Future, the Effect of Ac uh, Teacher Language on Student Academic Decision Making. And so um, what we're hoping to understand is if teachers' written academic feedback, so their comments on report cards to students is what we're looking at, if, that, if those comments vary based on student identities and if that varied feedback is then later correlated with students' academic decision making, specifically in STEM-related courses and STEM careers, we're interested in this because research has shown that teachers overwhelmingly associate STEM work with males rather than females. And we have also seen research that shows that teachers place lower <laughs> academic expectations on students of color. Um, so our method for this is to review those student transcripts and report cards, code teachers written feedback, so figure out whether certain teacher language is positive, negative, neutral, interview current students, so this is just something to get a kind of more qualitative sense of what do current students think about teacher feedback at their school, and we will be surveying alumni to see what their career choice has been. So the last project I'm going to talk about is a personal research interest of mine. This I submitted as just a poster to NASP. And so NASP is really just this, uh, NASP hosts an annual conference that really encourages graduate students to pursue their own work. So I put this together with two EDS students in the cohort below me called In Vivo Coaching to Support Teacher Implementation of Classroom Management. And so the purpose, I'm hoping to understand just generally what teachers think about class, uh, getting support for classroom management and the effectiveness and acceptability of that support. So like I said before, teachers overwhelmingly feel unprepared to handle student behavior. Coaching is a method where maybe the school psych or someone else, uh, a research staff member will come into, this, come into the classroom and actually give like verbal prompts or visual prompts of like, praise that student there or give them this consequence. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of just get an overall understanding of what that research shows through a systematic literature review. So, um, I think this is the last slide. So practicum, so each year I'm involved in a type of practicum and it varies slightly each year. So the first year I'm in pre-practicum where I'm really just in a general education classroom about eight hours a week seeing the general flow of a classroom. Um, I take cognitive, so that's IQ testing and educational assessment where we learn about benchmarking and I'm able to, from those classes, use those new skills in the classroom. We don't do IQ testing on students who don't need to have their IQ tested, but we do practice with educational assessment in the classroom. For year two, I'm in practicum and this is the really heavy uh, long hours year where I'm at a I'm at an elementary school for 12 hours a week under the supervision of a school psychologist, really acting as a school psychologist this year. I have a caseload. I have uh, teachers and classrooms to support. And so meanwhile, I'm taking classes around social and behavioral assessment, preventing and intervening for achievement and mental health problems, and consultation. Oops. And so for year three, which I'm in right now, um, for our advanced, our advanced practicum, we're not um, sent to a specific site. Rather, we are called in when there is support needed. So what that looks like is maybe hosting seminars for uh, school districts that are saying they need more information of what good classroom management looks like, um, bigger problems that come up in schools where districts aren't sure what to handle, They'll, or how to handle, they'll ask our team for support, conducting outside evaluations. And then um, these classes also are just example classes. Some classes I pulled, we also take additional classes. But one class, is, one class that is really important this year is research methods and group designs, which I already feel like I have 
item advantage from Eastern's research methods course where we develop a proposal about doing a group design and that will likely set us up for our dissertation. Okay, so to sum, lessons learned. I Let's see, I slightly don't remember what I put here. Okay, I learned that school psychologists work with teachers a bit more than they work with students. This was new to me. I love working with students. I think adults is a whole nother game that I wasn't quite prepared for, but this really comes from the lens of if we want to prevent problems in schools, we should start with teachers who then can reach their students. Um, school psychologists need to be extremely flexible. They're working in a school, so it is a bit chaotic. Every day is something different, but at the same time I see it as a pro because you can use so many different skills. You have so many different uh, responsibilities as well. So this is something um, I'm really learned, especially this third year into graduate school. So I have two more years to go, and it has been difficult. There is a lot of work. There are a lot of responsibilities placed on me, and you are in a system where it is kind of the norm, right? So I've learned some ways to advocate for myself. I think the big one has been my cohort for support. We have this cohort model where we're taking really all the same classes, we're with each other 24 seven. We really lean on each other a lot. I talk to um, cohorts above me who have gone through things. So I've just learned that if you wanna get through grad school okay, you need to have time to prioritize your mental health. Um, just for applying, having an idea of your research interests is helpful. I feel lucky because I feel like my research interests really align with what the program is already doing, so make sure to think about that beforehand. And securing funding, try to find out how the program has been with funding. Um, I was really drawn and picked UMass because on interview day they said that they have been able to fund every student that comes in the program with a tuition waiver and a hourly paid position for the last like 10 years or so. So I was like, okay, I'm going here. Um, so for me, that was helpful because there's also often not really time to work a second job while in grad school. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. And I'd love to hear any comments or questions you have for me. Go ahead and stop the recording for question time. Uh,